Okay, so today is Monday, September 21st, and we're, uh, this is ECE 641, model-based image processing, and today we're going to start actually talking about really reconstructing images, okay? Uh, so, uh, but we had a question, so I think I'll answer the question first. So, Alessandro, did you have a question? Yeah, what part of the error function in a Gaussian Markov random field is actually the Gaussian Markov random field? Okay, so in the Gaussian Markov random field, remember X, S, all right, and then S is a, a lattice point, okay? That's the Gaussian Markov random field, okay? So, a Gaussian Markov random field is like a random process in two dimensions. Actually, it's in arbitrary numbers of dimensions. Okay, but the reason they call it field is because originally it was in two dimensions. The first uh, motivation for generating Gaussian for Markov random fields was that they wanted the model, there's certain, we're going to find out later, there's this fundamentally, when you go from one to two dimensions, the properties of a random field sort of fundamentally change. Actually, it came out of material science, okay, because um, uh, there's a thing called uh, a uh, Ising model, which you may be familiar with, right? So the Ising model, people were trying to understand fundamental physical phenomena. We'll talk about this later, like magnetism. And uh, it turns out that, so they tried to do the 1D case to try to see, uh, you know, if the things that they had observed physically, macroscopically, occurred. They tried trying to come up with mathematical models that represented the phenomena that they've observed, okay? And they didn't work. The models didn't work. So it turns out that uh, in order for those models to work, you had to go to the two dimensions. And, and it's for the same reason, because the two-dimensional structure is fundamentally different. When you go to three and four, now actually real materials are actually not two-dimensional. They're three-dimensional, usually at least. So you'd say, well, maybe you have to go to three. Well, no, because when you go from one to two, there's a fundamental change because of the fact that the graph structure becomes loopy. And uh, so the original work on these things was done to model those sorts of behaviors. They were like, uh, and in, actually it also came out of things like, uh, you know, uh, studying plants, okay? And, and also so, it's like social, um, social modeling, okay, like I guess I'm really outside of my space of knowledge, okay, but I'll just say, like, I, it may actually be the wrong term, honestly, but I'll just say, like political science, like understanding like how people make decisions about things in groups, okay, because people influence each other, okay, and, um, and so you get sort of a, uh, uh, and it, today, actually, it's a hot topic in the, in the sense of modeling social networks, okay? Like, you know, and of course it has a lot of economic impact in things like, you know, these, all these social, this, uh, all these packages, these software assist things that I don't use, like, um, it's hard for me to even say their names, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all that junk, okay? Well, obviously, it's a big deal, okay? So it's because you can model interactions on those things with graphs, right? And Google, Google as a company exists because of this, because, because they had the, the first, I'm sure that their, their, their uh, search engine is very different today, but the fundamental innovation that they had was they had this insight that when you want to do searching on the, the original search engines like AltaVista, you just, they literally tried to just hash the uh, network and, the, you know, search for like terms or something. And they were horrid. Okay, I can remember when they started. So you, the World Wide Web was kind of cool, but you couldn't find anything on it. Somebody had to basically tell you. It was like a phone number. If you just tried to find somebody by dialing random phone numbers, it was like pretty useless. But then uh, Google had this massive insight, or the researchers, I uh, forget their names, the two fellows, I guess they were from Stanford, that had this insight that rather than just search for that um, to match the node, you, you match the graph structure. 
So that was sort of the fundamental insight that made their search engine like far superior to everything else. Since then, I'm sure they've done a lot more sophisticated things. But um, so this idea of the graph, the behaviors of the graph as opposed to a 1D structure is fundamental. And that's what makes Markov random fields really important. Because uh, basically, this point is dependent upon the neighboring points, right? in a graph structure. So the thing that's the mark of random field is the actual random process on the graph itself. But the prop the defining property, the defining property is that is that uh, uh, you know uh, well for lack of a better way of writing it I'll just say epsilon s, right? This thing is uh, xs minus the conditional expectation of xs given xk for k not equal to s. And it turns out that this thing, if it's a Markov random field, this thing, uh, I'll, I'll put an x through here, is equal to xs. Uh, x, it's, it's only dependent upon a finite number of neighbors. But actually, the defining property of a Markov random field is that it's only dependent on a finite number of neighbors. Because if you make it dependent on all the neighbors, then everything's a Markov random field. So it's really the finiteness that's the defining property. And for a Gaussian Markov random field, you only have to have a linear dependency. So, so this, becomes, this becomes like xs minus some function of the neighbors, right? So and that's why you end up having the sum over say k, a member of the neighbors, uh, we'll say uh, h of s minus k, or h of, yeah, h of k, well, it's h of s k times x k, like this, OK? That's sort of the general form. And if it's a, a homogeneous, then it's only a function of the difference. OK, so this isn't the Markov random field. But, the, um, but what makes the, the prediction important is that, <coughs> excuse me, it's a minimum mean square error prediction, right? Because it's conditional expectation. But the thing that's actually the Markov random field is x. Now, you might say, now this sort of begs the issue, which is that this is all fine and well, but who cares? And why? Like, it's the only thing here that seems to be useful is that we're predicting something here, OK? And everything else is like, why are we bothering, OK? OK, perfect question, because we're now entering chapter four. Oh, no, not chapter four. We're entering chapter five. We're entering chapter five, OK? And chapter five, at this point, it's been a long haul. You're a bit weary. But you're like, why have we been doing all this? Well, we've been doing it because we think it's going to be useful for something. Well, what is it going to be useful for, hopefully? To, we're going to reconstruct the images. This is all about image reconstruction, OK? It could be not necessarily like image reconstruction used to refer to things like tomography, OK? But now it's kind of being more broadly. Uh, it's, I think the ta ta term has fallen into more broad use, OK? Which is that whenever you have, OK, uh, I'm, I'm really rewinding back to the very beginning of the course, but that doesn't really, that's not a bad thing, I think, OK? Because what ends up happening is you're coming down and you're like, you're like, oh, we've been on this hike, but where are we going, OK? Well, let's review where we're going, OK? Where we're going is this, that uh, you have a sensor. OK, you have a sensor. And this is the world. OK, the world, I guess, has trees in it and stuff, or whatever. And, and the sensor takes in information, OK? And the output of the sensor is what we're calling y, OK? And then from this, we want to form x, OK? And x, this is a computational. imaging system. So what's a computational imaging system? Basically, you could take the word computational out and you'd be pretty much correct. Because 
there are almost, I mean, like, you know, 50 years ago, there were imaging systems that weren't computational. I guess all the computation got done in analog. But in the modern world, all imaging systems are computational imaging systems, okay? Your cell phone's a computational imaging system, your camera, anything, okay? Anything you get. I don't care. You could be like some, you know, when I was a kid, we used to have, they still have gumball machines where you put like a nickel in? Okay, yeah. So you could get the camera that comes out of the gumball machine and it'll be a computational imaging system because there are no analog, purely analog imaging systems. And it, what comes out of the sensor is never a useful image, okay? A sensor produces data, okay? And from that data, now you have to make an image, okay? So. There's actually, uh, oh, what, there's a lecture or something about this, that uh, there's some famous book by some famous photographer. Okay, because people would always say, I'm gonna take an image, okay? Uh, I gotta look this up, okay, you know, snap. And that was true in those days because cameras had analog, they had film. Their light just shone on the film. You took the film and you put it in, like, uh, you know, a, you developed it in a bath and you got an image, okay? Even then, it's really analog processing because it, it was amazing. They basically built computation into the chemistry. That's why Kodak made so much money because they had very sophisticated chemistry that could make images, okay? But, you don't, you don't take an image, you make an image, okay? <laughs> it's got, the image has got to be made, okay? It's got to be computed. It always has to be computed. So then the question is, how are you going to do that? So we have to have this system here that makes this image, right? Now what I'm arguing to you is that what's really happening, there, this is, that's sort of the physical world, but this is your model is that this is the image this is this is the image you wanted okay this is the sensor say model okay and then out of that comes y and then you're going to take this and it's going to produce x hat right so in order to actually ever implement a real imaging system ever to implement a computational imaging system you always have to do this not just sometimes always okay you always have to compute something and one way of looking at it is you're trying to find the thing that you didn't observe directly because you never observed the dir thing directly there's always noise distortion if you could actually measure the thing you wanted to observe uh, display directly it would be too expensive and you would choose not to do it, <laughs> okay? So you always, for all intents and purposes, you always do this, okay? So then, so then the question is, how do you do this, okay? Well, there's a variety of different approaches, but most of them, modern approaches, tend to be based on this idea of kind of a model-based approach, okay? Where, where your goal then is you x hat here is equal to the, some kind of estimator. Well, first of all, it's got to be t of y, okay? Because what else could it be? And then uh, it might be something like some estimate. This is going to be an estimate of x, okay? Now, there's two things usually, not always, but there's usually two things that you really want to model or embody with this approach. One is the forward model. of sensor and that's P of Y given X. So that's a pretty broad model, right? If I'm because I'm allowing any probability distribution 
for the distribution of the measurements given the unknown. And then, but we also have a prior model. Okay, of image. And that's P of X. And both are really important. You might say, and, and that's the, the argument that both are really important is, um, I don't think I'm going to actually need this because the answer to your question is more abstract, I believe, okay? <clears throat> Although you may disagree with me in the end. And I guess you're the ultimate arbiter. But I'll do my best. What can I tell you? So uh, this is this idea. If you have a linear sensor, which not all sensors are linear, but a lot are linear, and it's a good conceptual starting point. You have a million pixels, but you have, say, 100,000 measurements. So each of those measurements represents an equation for the, you know, ideally each of those measurements would be, well, ideally, we think ideally. In fact, it's going to turn out it wasn't ideal, okay? But let's pretend that, that each of those measurements was a measurement of a single individual pixel, right? Then you'd say, well, that's simple. It turns out it's actually not ideal, but it's simple because I know exactly what I'm measuring, I'm measuring individual pixels. But Actually, it turns out that it's a lot better not to do that. It's better to measure co more complicated things, okay? So instead of measuring one pixel at a time, you may measure some linear combination of a set of pixels or of all pixels. So what that means is you have a set of equations. So if you have, uh, if you have two unknowns and one equation, that means that uh, the set of solutions falls on a... Um, a line, right? Basically, a, it falls on a, a manifold, a linear manifold, like this. So if you have, if you have, um, if you have like a, a million unknowns, but a hundred thousand equations, right? That means that the solution falls on a hundred thousand dimensional uh, manifold, linear manifold, and that means that, but that means that the space that's orthogonal to that has a dimension of 900,000, <laughs> okay? So in that case, you only have a fraction of the measurements you need, right? So what are you to do, okay? Well, what ends up happening is you say, well, but images can't just be anything. So, so what I'm gonna do is say, okay, real images live on this manifold like this. So then I can get a solution. So, so, and you'd say, well, oh gosh, that's a pretty strong assumption. But hey, think about it. If you generate white noise, the chances of the white noise looking like an image is really infinitesimally small. So the vast majority of the space that the images live in is empty. And if you come back to my original, I had a diagram over here. I'll show it one more time because it's good. I showed it before, but I'm sure you didn't have any idea what I was talking about before. I want them. I'm not hurting your feelings. I hope I'm not hurting your feelings. I'm not meaning to hurt your feelings, okay? Okay. Um, so let's say that you knew every, this is an image, okay? Let's say you know every, you have all the pixels in the image except for one pixel. You're just missing one pixel. Can you fill in the missing pixel? Of course you can fill in the missing pixel. Because you're going to just make the pixel similar to its neighbors, right? If it's in a smooth region, it's going to be really easy to fill in. But even if it's on an edge, you should be able to do a pretty good job. But you'll have to try to figure out exactly where that edge is, okay? <laughs> and then fill in a value that matches, correct? Well, that means that if you know this, I can only draw in two dimensions, okay, because of my human limitations. But if I, if this was the dimension, if this plane here was, was n minus one dimension, so it was 999,999 dimensional. And then this axis is one dimensional, right? What that means is that if I know this, I can guess this. I can guess that missing pixel. The fact that I can guess that missing pixel means that this thing has to be very thin. So this is a low dimensional manifold. 
most of the space is empty. Most of the space that the image lives in is empty. So, so if you can characterize that, and remember, this is a generic model that fits all images. Actually, it could even go across crazy sets of images. It could be natural photographs and, and medical images and images of materials, although they would be somewhat different. So if I know I'm looking at material images under a microscope, I, what I expect is going to I'm not going to expect to see my uh, cousin uh, Bob uh, waving to me in a microscope image, although I guess it could happen. So, but, so the point is that this dramatically restricts your solution. But when you do that, there's a danger, right? The danger is that if I assume that my image is a picture of my Uncle Bob waving to me, then guess what? I'm going to get a picture of Uncle Bob waving to me, right? It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, <laughs> okay? That self-fulfilling prophecy is the idea of bias. My solution becomes biased because I restrict it to fall in a certain manifold. So you'd say, well, I don't like bias, so I'm not gonna have that. I don't have any choice because if I, if I eliminate all the bias, then I have an, an infinite manifold, an infinite dimensional manifold that's, that's uh, 900,000 dimensional that I don't know. So it could be anywhere in there, okay? So it becomes hopeless. You can't solve that problem. So, so you have to intru introduce the bias. So given that you're going to introduce the bias, the, the strategy becomes introduce as little bias as possible with this least, with the least, the least onerous bias, okay? So to do that, there's two things you need, there's actually a number of things you need to do. Yes? Could you have the case where like you've got two equal light likely pixels though? So say you've got like a region that's noisy or something and you're trying to reconstruct that region and then you have like a multi-mode thing. Like well, yes, so there, what you're saying is that you can have places where, I like to call this thing a thin manifold, because it actually has some thickness, right? And you're saying there could be situations where the thickness becomes quite significant. Yeah, or, or maybe there's like two bumps. Or there's, well, um, uh, yeah, there could be, you could have like uh, the curve, I don't I could, could be like this, right? And then if you fall right here, there could be a, quite a bit of uncertainty. Right. Okay. Right. So there's all kinds of nasty things that can go wrong. I don't. I don't want to minimize that. And bias is bad. But my argument is we have no choice. Because if we insist on having zero bias, then we have infinite variance. So infinite variance is unacceptable. So then somewhere between infinity and zero has got to be your best solution, or at least a good solution. So, so it becomes not just a mathematical calculation, it also becomes a qualitative choice, a subjective evaluation based upon your application space. If you're, if you're, if you're, going to, if you're making a measurement which is going to determine some therapy for you to live or die, then that's, the stakes are much higher, right? And, you, and certainly, you know, the thing about doctor do no harm, you don't want to go, you know, like make a mis... Well, an example would be, you know, um, if you... Oh, actually, this actually really happens. So, you know, there's... Uh, actually, a friend of mine, I didn't actually see the talk, but I, I believe he gave this talk because I, he gives similar talks, and I'm, this is the kind of thing he would say. So if it's untrue, I apologize. But a friend of mine, actually, Jeff Fessler, who actually was an undergraduate here, he's in Michigan, he has algorithms for doing reconstruction of images based upon uh, using deep neural networks, as do I, actually. But, and the particular algorithm he was showing was probably not his. It was probably somebody else's. But he was demonstrating that, OK, so you build these algorithms, you train them, and now you get an image, and the image looks terrific. You show it to a radiologist, and the radiologist says, this image looks beautiful. This is a beautiful reconstruction, OK? Except there's one problem. The place where the tumor was, you got rid of it. 
<laughs> okay? So the, the reconstruction looks perfect. It looks like a beautiful reconstruction, except for it doesn't have the tumor in it. So that's an example of the bias introducing. And the reason the, the thing looks perfect is because you had a beautiful model of what a CT image should look like. And that model was so well informed, it made sure that that image looked exactly like it should, okay? Except for it's wrong, <laughs> okay? So, so that would be an example of very bad bias. So the, so the trick is that, the bias, so there's two things you need to, there's actually three things you need. There's three, three and then there's sort of a fourth, but there's three things you need in order to figure, to cre create a reconstruction algorithm, okay? You need the forward model, that's the model of your sensor. That we don't talk about much in this class because most sensors, many sensors are different, okay? You need a model of the image you're reconstructing. That we spent a lot of time talking about in this class because that's the sort of generic piece. That uh, Generic modeling methods can work across application spaces, okay? I mean, some work better in certain application spaces than others. And then the third thing you need is you need an estimator, T, okay? That incorporates those models. The fourth thing you need is sort of a little bit, um, uh, peripheral, because it's sort of part of this estimator, is you need a way of computing it, okay? <laughs> okay you, you need a way of computing on a computer in a practical sense. People usually confuse the computational technique with the estimator and the models, right? Because these are abstract, <laughs> okay? Whereas the computation, they at least feel as concrete, even though it's not, because it runs on a computer and they can touch it, okay? I can touch a computer. Interestingly, I'm gonna touch a computer. Guess what, I'm not touching a computer. I'm touching the monitor of the computer. <laughs> you know, like, this is the thing, abstraction, that people have problems with abstraction, okay? It, like computer science. Computer science is not like about computers. It's about algorithms. But if you call it algorithmic science, nobody would know what you're talking about. I mean, there's some people who study actual computers and computer science, but most of them study algorithms, okay? So these are abstract, the models, and then the estimator, and then the way of computing it. So now, why, yes? I, so I guess I'm wondering, in these pictures, we have a single, like, manifold. And I guess my question is, like, are there ever multimodal manifolds? And is that, does that fit into this general picture here? Yes. Like of course. You only have one big line, but you can right. have like three or four. Yeah, lines. the whole concept of calling it a, first of all, if you notice, I don't really call it a manifold, at least not when it's written down. I call it a thin, oops, thin manifold. Now, you might ask, why do I call it a thin manifold? I call it a thin manifold because the thin manifold has no definition. So therefore, I can't be wrong, okay? Okay, because if I called it a manifold, you'd say, well, that's not a manifold, and you'd be right, okay? So it's just like when, when, you, when you say, uh, whenever you emphasize, whenever you say, if you say, if you say something's very accurate, you mean it's not accurate, right? Or if you say, if I, if like you say, oh, I, when, when, in general, whenever people say something, they mean the opposite as a general rule. Keep that, write that down, because that's a really good life uh, rule, which is somebody say, it's not that I think that person's not very bright. And that means that you don't think that person's very bright, okay? So, and I would never say that about Purdue administrators, by the way. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's recursive. Okay. Um, so by saying thin manifold, I'm really saying it's not thin, <laughs> okay? It's got some thickness to it, and it may not even be a manifold, okay? But uh, it's sort of locally approximatable maybe by manifold. You know, I think that there's still a lot of debate about what the structure really is. Uh, I think the only thing that's not debatable is that there's some kind of structure because, and if you take images, like if you, like say, uh, do a plot of the color space of an image, you'll see that, you know, there will be structures that like this and complicated stuff like that and it might bifurcate in places. 
So it's not just very simple, that's true. But the important thing is that it's mostly empty. And locally, it's manifold-like, I would argue. But I guess, yeah, but there's not, but there could be two big arcs. Like, oh yeah, for sure. Okay, okay. Well, usually what happens, it could be, but usually what happens is that you usually don't have something like, uh, you usually don't have something like this, and the reason is is that that would imply at two points that there's two possible values you could have for the same pixel. Okay. It can happen, like if you have an edge, but you never really have an edge like that, right? But like, what if the face of a person's missing in the photo, and then there's lots of possible faces or something? But that's more than one pixel. Oh, I see. That's a lot of pixels. Okay. So that's a little different situation. Okay. But I'm just trying to make this argument, yeah. I mean, this is hard, right? So I'm just trying to make little tiny arguments, okay? okay. But, but it gets the gist of cross, which is that the important thing is that if you don't make assumptions about, first of all, the two key ideas is that the space that images live in is mostly empty, okay? And that that the, weird, the, the structure of hell is not empty really cuts across many, um, it's really quite general, right? So you can show me any image, and you can say, is that a valid image? I can say, yeah. You can show me something else, you say, is that a valid image? I'll say, no, okay? I mean, you can show me a picture of a natural photograph, I'll go, like, yeah, that's an image, okay? But you could show me an image, and the colors are all messed up, and I'll say, is that a valid image? I'll say, like, you, you reverse the colors. I'll go, no, that's not a valid image, okay? You can show me a, a, a painting, a Picasso painting, and I'll say, yeah, that's a valid image, but people don't really look like little squares, okay? But the, so there's a lot of common structure in images. If you just create random noise, the chance of it looking like a sailboat on the Charles River is zero, okay? So, I mean, that's important to keep in mind because we take that for granted. You know, but so so my point is this: this model is crucially important. It's crucially important. Humans use this models of reality that are very strong, and that's how it allows us to make inference in extraordinarily complex situations that are amazingly accurate. Okay, and that's why machine learning works because you have these models implicit in the algorithms that um, model the distribution, the way things really occur. And if this model's wrong, you're really going to screw up. And so what you want this model to be is you want this model to be as tight as possible, but not too tight. So I think that was the thing that Albert Einstein said, which is that every model should be as complicated or sort of be is uh, complicated as possible, but not too complicated. <laughs> is that what did this Albert Einstein say? It was like it has or the simplest. Uh, I think it's the simplest consistent hypothesis. Right. It's it's like Occam's razor, right? Is the other similar kind of idea. Yeah. And Occam's razor, so you should have the the simplest explanation is usually the correct one, right? So. So, so that brings us back to the original question. Gaussian Markov random fields. Why do we spend all this time talking about Gaussian Markov random fields? Because that is going to be our prior model. So we haven't actually used it for anything yet. And that's what's leaving you feeling cold. You're like, why are we talking about these things? The reason we're talking about them is because the next step is to start using them. And that's actually why, I, when I wrote this crazy thing that I've been working on since the beginning of time, I put the next chapter as at map estimation with Gaussian priors because at this point you're too exhausted. So it's time you have to do something with it. Then after we are finished with this, we'll say, oh, that was good except for it doesn't work very well, okay? And then we'll move on to the non-Gaussian case so you get a break, okay? So, but the point is that the reason we're doing this is in preparation. We're building the models that we're going to use to solve the problems, but we haven't solved them yet. That's sort of the next step. So did that answer your question? Yes. Good. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, I try to give some motivation at the very beginning of the class, but I know that you mostly don't know what I'm talking about. 
So then I try to do some stuff and then try to give some more motivation. I try to go back and forth a little bit. Okay. Um, it, it's really funny. Um, if you ever, how many people here have taught like a T8 for a class or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So when you teach, I think most people who teach have had this experience that when you teach, you know, you'll teach something like vectors, like teaching vectors to undergraduates is the classic example. Because for you, vectors are such an obvious idea, right? But if you're a freshman in engineering, you're just learning about vectors for the first time. This is mind-boggling concept, right? And you'll like try to explain it this way and that way. And you'll say, well, vector is like, uh, you know, uh, an array of numbers, uh, ordered pair, over numbers. It represents this point in space. Blah blah blah. You can take the inner product, and, and they'll just look at you. And then, and you'll be talking to them, and they'll like say, so, you, so then, can you like think of this set of numbers as being an arrow in space? And you'll go, yeah. And they'll go. <laughs> Why didn't you say that in the beginning? Okay, <laughs> and you've said it like 50 times. So the best thing to do to make them feel better is say, "Yeah, next time I'll remember to say that." Okay, but <laughs> yeah. So because that's how brain people th that's how people absorb ideas, right? You have to kind of see it multiple times, and then all of a sudden it clicks in. Um, so okay, now. So this is chapter five. So this is map estimation with Gaussian priors. So, um, uh, so the forward model, so the model. The model we're going to consider here is this. We have some observations y equals ax plus w. OK? So x is going to be a gauss markov rand field. Surprise, surprise. So it's going to have, as so x is going to be distributed as zero mean with a, with a variance of uh, an inverse co, uh, an inverse covariance of b, b. So b is the precision matrix, okay? And we know that uh, b here, because you've learned all that wonderful stuff in the last chapters, that this thing is going to be gamma inverse i minus g, okay? Where if if the gamma was if, this, if the prediction variance was constant, it could be like one over sigma non-causal squared i minus g. Okay, because gamma is usually a uh, diagonal matrix, and it, in the cert oh, you know one thing I added a homework problem actually. You know the reason I avoid the the the, the stationary case is tricky because of the fact that it requires that you go to infinity and then you can't represent it as a vector anymore. Because, you know, well, I guess you could extend the definition of vectors to have infinite dimension, but it gets complicated. So, so uh, but as long as you make things circulant, then everything works out like as you expect. It's a little misleading for some reason I won't go into, but everything works out the way you expect as long as it's circulant because because then you can use circular convolution, and the Fourier transform uh, diagonalizes a circulant matrix, which is, that was one of the problems you had, right? So everybody knows if you want to if you want to implement circular convolution, what do you do? You take the FFT, right? By the way, the FFT is the same thing as the DFT, right? What's the distinction between the FFT and the DFT? Oh, was it yeah, this is. Sorry. It's just a faster version. So usually I refer to the DFT because that's the fundamental algorithm. FFT is just, but you know, among the regular people, they'll just say FFT, right? FFT, but it's really the DFT. So you can always implement any circular convolution with the f of t, right? Because all you do is, you t if you, if you want to, if like y of n is equal to x of n convolved with h of n, right? Then what, to do circular convolution, what you do is you take x, you take its f of t, right? Everybody knows that? Then what do you do? You multiply by y. If you were to compute a circular convolution, you take the f of t of the signal and you do y. 
you convolution in time is equivalent to block in block. Excuse me? Multiplication in frequency. So that would mean you take this thing and you multiply it by what? The Fourier transform of, of H, right? But you don't really multiply by the Fourier transform directly because it has to be multiplied by a matrix. So you multiply by a, yeah, yes, diagonal matrix, right? So we'll call that lambda, right? And then what you do, then you take the inverse Fourier transform and that produces Y, correct? And lambda and n, the diagonal matrix, the, so lambda is equal to diag, uh, we'll call this thing H, oh, we'll call it H, HN, right? And HN is going to be what? HN is the FFT. A, well, I'll just put F, uh, this is the Fourier transform of H. Right, so, right. Er, you, but everybody knows this. You take the, if you want to convolve two things, you take the Fourier transform, you multiply them, you take the inverse Fourier transform, okay? But it's really, if it, the problem with the Fourier transform is that you can't really do it because the Fourier transform of a three time signal is continuous in frequency. So it has an infinite number of, amount of information. You can't start on a computer. So anything you want to do on the computer, you have to do with an F of T. If you use an F of T, it's really circular convolution, okay? People often forget that and they use the F of T as if it's actually computing the Fourier transform. It's not. It's computing the, uh, it's computing like the DFT, which is a, you know, it's different, okay? It can be, it's closely related, but it's different, okay? Everybody remember that? Just checking, that's gonna get used in a problem. So, Okay, so you know this. I'm really running out of time. Okay, then the conditional distribution, then Y is distributed as, it's sort of conditionally, okay, what I'm gonna write here, I wouldn't write in the textbook because it's, it's really kind of misleading, but it's conditionally normal. What's its conditional mean? I'll write, oh, I'll write Y given X, okay? It's the conditional distribution of Y given X. What's the conditional distribution of y give, give, what's the conditional, excuse me, the conditional mean of y given x? What's the mean? If I know x, what's the mean of y? Okay, let me do this. This thing, w is zero mean and its covariance is rw, say, okay? So assuming W is zero mean, what's the mean of Y given X? It's gonna be A times X. If I tell you what X is, then, you, then this is a constant, which you're adding to a zero mean random variable. So then that means the conditional mean of Y is gonna be A times X, right? And then what's the conditional variance of Y given X? It'd be RW, right? So, so P of Y given X, that's a conditional, uh, that's a, that's a, a zero mean Gaussian random variable, uh, no, it's not zero mean, it's A of X and it's RW. Does that, does that mean, let me write this down and then let's talk about it a little bit because it's really important to understand this. This is B, this is zero. So this is the forward model. And this is prior. So this is the model of the sensor. This is a linear model, by the way. And it says that if I know x, then, then the mean of y will be ax. 
but it'll have additive noise of covariance RW. And then the prior model is this, and here we're going to assume that the structure for B, the precision, mat the precision matrix B, is a precision mat matrix of a Markov random field. Now, if the precision matrix is the matrix of a Markov random field, what does that tell us about B, by the way? What do we know about B? If this is, this is a Gaussian Markov random field, so it has a neighborhood, right? So it means, let's pretend that every point has four nearest neighbors. So what does that tell you about the structure of B? It's going to be sort of diagonal. Not really because it's a toplet starts topless matrix, and so there's, there's, but it's sparse. Okay, if it was one D, it'd be diagonal. It's sparse. Along every row, how many non-zero elements will there be along every row of B? Four plus one. Four plus one, five. Yes, excellent. Very good. Totally impressed. Okay, and during every column, how many non-zero elements will there be? Here's a clue. What properties does B have? It's symmetric. So the number of non-zero elements along every column has to be the same as the number of non-zero elements along every row. So what's the answer? Five. Five. Same thing, right? So the not diagonal element won't, won't be zero. The diagonal element will be actually one over it's actually 1 over the non-causal prediction variance squared. And then the non-zero the, the non non elements along each row represent what? The, it starts with the letter N. And is very closely related to Mr. Rogers. Neighbor. Neighbor. <laughs> okay. You guys are post Mr. Rogers, I guess. It's a little sad, but it's their neighbors, okay? I want to be your neighbor, okay? All right, okay, you get that? Now this is a model, okay? This is a model, but what about, um, what is the, uh, okay, what is the map estimate? Okay, the map estimate, oh gosh, we're out of time. The map estimate. We talked about the map estimate. The map estimate is the arg max over x of the probability of x given y, right? Okay. But that's equal to the arg min over x of the negative log of the probability of y given x minus the log of the probability of x. Okay? So, what are those? Well, there's a lot of complicated terms in there, but most of them you can drop because you only have to care about anything that's a function of, uh, of x. You don't care about anything that's not a function of x, okay? So, the log of p of, of y given x when you take the negative log, that's going to look like one half the norm of y minus of y minus ax squared plus a constant. Okay, the constant is a bunch of stuff that's not a function of x. Uh, the minus the log of p of x that's equal to one half the norm of. Um, Log, uh, it's going to actually be x transpose bx plus c prime, which is another constant. And notationally, we can write this like this. Okay? If I put a subscript of a b on a norm, it, use, it means it's a quadratic norm, and b is the um, is, serves this role. It's an outer product. And that B should be symmetric and positive definite, okay? For it to be a legit norm. Okay. 
so that the map estimate is equal to arg min over of um, one half y minus ax squared plus one half x transpose bx. All right. Okay. If I solve that, I can solve that by differentiating it. And the answer I get is, uh, what's the answer I get? I want to write it down because otherwise I'll say it incorrectly. I get that x hat is equal to uh, a transpose a plus sigma squared b inverse a transpose y. So you'd say, well, we're done. The problem with this, you're going to read the notes, correct? The problem with this is that I can't compute it for most applications. Because a here is humongous. So if this is a million pixels, and let's say I have a million measurements, then this is a million squared. So I don't, I can't just write these A down in MATLAB. It's a conceptual A, but you don't actually write it down explicitly. Once in a while you can write it down as, as, as a, in a compressed form using its sparse structure if it's sparse. But normally you can't actually write it down, okay? So this is a beautiful thing, but it's not really useful. The problem is, is that you can't really do this inverse. You can't write the matrices down. You can't do any of this. So instead, most of this section is going to all be about how you solve this problem indirectly with some approximation. By approximation, I mean numerical precision, depending on how many iterations you want to run, using optimization. So the idea is rather than try to get a closed form solution, the closed form solution is useless. Instead what you do, well it's not useless, but it's not computationally useful. But you instead you solve it iteratively with the optimization strategy, you accept the reduced precision, but it makes it much more computationally tractable. I got, so we have to finish now, but thanks a lot and I'll see you on Wednesday, all right? Take care, bye.